And I think that Putin's probably still working out how he can keep these useful assets and, and but tame them now that he knows that they can turn on him. How can you make sure that you still have this asset, but prevent them from doing a progression? Hello and welcome to Frontline for Times Radio with me, Kate Chabot. And today we are catching up with diplomatic correspondent Catherine Philp, who in her almost 20 years at the Times has reported from conflicts ranging from Colombia to Afghanistan. And she's just back from Ukraine, where she's been many times and where she was when the invasion took place last year. Catherine, really good to have you on Frontline today. Thank you for your time. Can you tell us a bit more about where you were and what you saw on this latest trip? Sure. So um, I was in Ukraine when the um, Russians bombed the, <laughs> we suppose, bombed the dam that um, that sat above uh, southern Ukraine, above Kherson, and inundated that area ahead of an expected counteroffensive by Ukraine. Um, and... So I, I was essentially there to sort of waiting for this counteroffensive that we've been waiting to happen for some time. It was expected to be a spring counteroffensive. And in fact, it, it went into the summer. I mean, the Ukrainians say to an extent that it hasn't really begun in earnest yet. Um, so so first of all, there was that which which was a sort of had a huge impact in Ukraine and on the world, because they were, everyone was prepared to see what Russia was actually prepared to do in order to change the battlefield, that they were prepared to um, destroy uh, a civilian, inf uh, something of a civilian infrastructure in order to change the battlefield in that way. And then after that, um, I went to where, the, you know, the Ukrainians said this won't change our plans and that their plans for a counteroffensive were further east. And so I went to first to Zaporizhia Oblast and then to uh, eastern Ukraine to see what they were managing to do there. And what it really was, was a very... Um, slow incremental push forward into the territory that the Russians had taken uh, since the um, invasion last year um, into that territory. The, I went with the Ukrainian military into some of that territory that they had retaken. And it really was a chance to see quite how difficult <laughs> this is going to be for them because uh, it was a very slow advance. It wasn't like the previous ones where the Russians had given up their positions and left. It was a push forward to very heavily defended positions. And while we were there, it it was an area that the, you know, the Russians were fighting back and they were shelling it constantly and they were attacking it constantly. So it was, it was pretty dangerous to be there because it wasn't secure territory. Um, it was... Um, it, it, it's going to be, I think that people have expected this counteroffensive to be like the ones before where, where the Ukrainians were able to retake other territory like Kharkiv and Kherson. And in fact, it's going to be much slower and much more difficult. And, and essentially, that's what I saw. Yeah. And how difficult would it be just to advance even just one kilometre in those circumstances? I mean, very difficult and that's what we saw really that they were only advancing about you know often less than a kilometer at a time so essentially the main issue uh that soldiers there described to me was that uh that the not only were the russians very well defended there they have these lines of defenses that are well constructed they have um they have trenches, they have minefields and layers upon layers of these going back several miles. Um, but also they have air support and the Ukrainians do not. And, you know, I think we all know and remember that the Ukrainians have been asking us for that. They've been asking for S-16s and being there was a very, um, you know, good example of why they need it and why they uh, have been asking for it because 
the Russians are able to bring in this air support. So uh, things like attack helicopters, they're bringing those in when the Ukrainians are trying to advance and the Ukrainians don't have that air cover themselves. So they are very exposed when they advance forward to the Russian air support in those positions. And as you mentioned, uh, the Russian forces, when they're in a defensive mode, are formidable, but the resolve of the Ukrainian forces can't be underestimated either. Did you notice any change in tactics? Um, I think that we'll see that more when we get all the newly trained brigades in. So uh, we haven't, we've only seen about three of the NATO trained brigades uh, thrown at this offensive and I mean the, the the people I saw they did have Bradley fighting vehicles they had some of the uh, American armaments that have been sent to them they had these um, armoured vehicles and that allows them to push forward in a way that perhaps they weren't able to before but I think we'll see more of that when they they throw all these brigades at this offensive, which they haven't done yet. And we see a full blown sort of combined arms offensive. This is what uh, we've seen NATO talk about, about that's what they wanted to equip uh, Ukraine to do, a, a combined armed offensive. So we haven't seen that happen in totality yet. And I think we will see it in the coming weeks. Uh, and of the soldiers that you actually saw when you were there, did they seem equally uh, equipped? Uh, because I've heard reports that some of them have the, the latest top NATO equipment, body protection. Others have things supplied by by volunteers, by charities. Yeah, I mean, gosh, sorry, you know, I didn't say where did you get that flak jacket, but. Um, <laughs> But um, no, I mean, they all seem to have what they needed. And to be honest, w w what they needed more than anything was were armoured vehicles. I mean, we are, you know, on that front line, you're beyond the point of body armour. They need armoured vehicles. I mean, so, so when I went forward with them, they took me in their armoured vehicles, in their infantry fighting vehicles, rather than, you know, drive there with my own body armor it was beyond that point where it's just where that's what you have so and they had all the all of that yeah okay. and they they talked they talked about so they were using these max pros which are these um american armored vehicles and they talked about those as being lifesavers uh i mean we saw two that had been destroyed by russians but they said that no one inside them was killed so though you know they had been hit by um, shelling or, or, or air strikes, but it didn't kill any of the people inside. And, and that's critical because it's, you know, they need, they, they are obviously outnumbered by the Russians in terms of manpower. So it's very critical that they keep those people alive. And Catherine, the, the failed mutiny by the Wagner Group, led by Yevgeny Prigozhin, has pulled into sharp focus the presence of private military companies in Ukraine. You've done an inventory of the more than 25 that are there at the moment, which is a staggering number. When and how did it all start? I mean, it's been going since, I think, the 90s, but it really kicked off, as did Wagner, after the uh, Russians sort of I mean, so in Ukraine, people talk about the full scale invasion, meaning what happened last year. The reason that they caveat that or, or qualify that is because Russia really did invade in 2014. And we were all, you know, perhaps a little distracted and didn't pay enough attention to that happening. Um, and that's really when they got going, when, you know, we talk about those little little green men that came in to uh, eastern Ukraine. That was really the start of when these private military companies got going. And then as time went on, Wagner in particular became this instrument of Russian foreign policy in a way. And they became useful to use in places like Africa where you where Russia didn't want to commit its own troops or have sort of state liability for its foreign policy. And it used Wagner to extend its influence in places like Mali, the Central African Republic, and it was able to send Wagner as a 
you know, private forests essentially to prop up dictators in Africa and and also not only to spread uh, Russian influence there but also to get Russia a, a foothold in you know uh, I suppose a modern day scramble for Africa a resource war where they are able to um, get hold of mining concessions and you know m- minerals that were that were useful to the Russian state, but also that were rewards for those private companies and their paymasters uh, for their for their service to the Kremlin. Um, so it's yeah, essentially they were able to enrich themselves. Now, I mean, they, we've been left with this question: What happens to the African projects of Wagner and uh, and other private military companies after what's happened? in Russia and we don't really know yet and I don't think Moscow knows yet because this all happened very quickly. And and the revolt by the Wagner Group was triggered by this looming deadline for its fighters to sign a contract with the regular Russian army and join, be absorbed by them. Um, yeah. What happens to those soldiers now? I mean, it's still very unclear whether they can, the, the, the soldiers themselves who were involved in this rebellion can actually join the Russian military. Uh, The details, I think, are still being worked out because this was a very hastily done deal. So we know that if they wish to go to Belarus, where um, where Prigozhin, the leader, has has gone, has been exiled, um, they can go with him. Uh, Or if they weren't involved in the uprising, they can join the Russian military. Uh, or they can be amnestied. It, it's so unclear. I think this was a deal that was done in extreme haste and we have not seen the details. And satellite images have recently shown some movement at a disused military base in the south of Belarus. Um, everyone's saying this must be preparations for Prigozhin and his troops to arrive, whoever does. I mean, it does look, no matter what that, that movement is about, that Wagner is not going away anytime soon. I mean, certainly if these uh, men have not been given any other route out of it, if they were intimately involved in this uprising, that's probably the only option for them. Um, But yeah, to put them on a military base to allow them to regroup, you've got to question the wisdom of that. And I I mean, I'm, I'm aware that you know, NATO neighbours of Belarus are not very happy about the idea that they will have um, this force on their on their borders with Belarus. Yeah, and President Putin appears to be in a full purge of top levels of his security services. What do you think he's trying to achieve given the recent events? Well, he's in a difficult situation because he's trying to, uh, he was trying to put down a rebellion that had probably more support within his own regime than he would like to admit. Um, A lot of people are disquieted with the way that the war in Ukraine is going. So he's sort of trying to, I I think, I mean, you know, we we all try to get inside uh, Putin's mind and it's not easy, but he is trying to, uh, I think, Uh, appear gracious whilst doing away with a threat to his regime. So he looks, um, rather than look weak by granting uh, some sort of amnesty, he's trying to, I think, follow up, having given that amnesty to try and kind of neuter Prigozhin rather than, you know, lock him up. Um, He's trying to follow that up with looking gracious, giving an out, let to his people, but also he's looking for the people within his own military and his own regime who may continue to pose a threat to him. So I think we're looking at the beginnings of something like a purge where he is, I mean, you know, we there, there are several generals that have not been seen since Saturday. We're, we're you know, we, we're, we're weighing up reports of arrests we don't know the full truth yet and of of those generals Catherine um uh, you know there was the, the man in overall charge of the war in Ukraine General Valery Gerasimov and the man before him General Sergei Surovakin who's suspected as being involved potentially in this mutiny um do we have any idea what's happened to them 
Well, Sorovkin, I we don't. He is definitely in the frame because um, there's been an awful lot of reporting uh, from, you know, citing Western intelligence officials that he knew about this beforehand um, and for some time. So he is the one to watch, you know, what happens to him. Um, the others, I think, are people who were in Prigozhin's sight, uh, people that he thought were doing a bad job of of the war in Ukraine. Uh, so I think that they are people that actually, because weirdly, because of uh, Prigozhin's criticism of them, might be safer because to look uh, strong in the face of this rebellion would be to keep them in place. So it may take longer to see what happens to people the other people but um the people that are suspected of knowing or possibly being involved in this yeah I, we definitely need to see if they resurface or not and it's so difficult to know what the long-term impact is going to have this is all going to have inside russia itself and it's been said this week that prigozhin is like the monster that turned out to sort of of Putin's making. Um, the Frankenstein, exactly, yeah. Exactly, <laughs> Frankenstein's monster. How, I mean, how much of a threat do you think the private military companies pose inside Russia itself? I mean, this is, in a way, has is a new question because I don't think that we really considered what a threat they were to the regime until this happened. So they've really, uh, they're a bit like, um, if you think of them as like sort of the military wing of the oligarchs. So, the you know, we know the oligarchs. We're aware of how powerful they became. And I mean, we know this very well from you know, in Britain that, that we had so many of them living here in London and that they were able to... Um, operate in in clear sight they weren't you know they the, and they relied on the favors of Putin there was a kind of symbiotic relationship between them where they were a, able to enrich themselves because of his lar largesse the way that they ran companies for him or used state funds but it all came back to Putin it 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 they were they could do that as long as they operated as a sort of other diplomatic service to him, essentially, and as long as the money came back to him in some shape or form, some of it. So I think that what we're seeing now is the, the first backlash of these of the military wing of the oligarchs, in a sense, that, that they actually do have the power to turn on Putin. I mean, think of someone like, um, uh, I mean, we've, we've you know, think of these uh, oligarchs that Putin has had to get rid of before. Um, Kordakovsky, you know, who was a who uh, enriched himself through Putin and through his ownership of energy companies, and ended up in in prison for ten years, sent off to Siberia. He did get out. Uh, this is kind of a military version of that, that they are now proving themselves to be problematic, or at least one of them is. So, again, we're in the very early stages, and I think that Putin's probably still working out how he can keep these useful assets and, and but tame them now that he knows that they can turn on him. Mm -hmm. How can you make sure that you still have this asset but prevent them from doing a progression. And Catherine, the former Deputy Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, General Richard Shiref, has been on Times Radio and he warned um, that a weakened Putin could be much more dangerous. Uh, what's your analysis? I mean, yes, completely. I think that we have to fear uh, a desperate Putin. I think the, uh, the, I mean, obviously, I think to all of us, the most hor horrendous threat we can think of is the nuclear one. And it may not, you know, we're not even talking about, um, you know, an intercontinental ballistic nuclear missile, a missile with a nuclear warhead. We're talking about a tactical uh, battlefield nuke, which he has threatened to use already. Uh, I think, I mean, I have been quite, sober about that mm. in the past I don't think he's going to do uh, you know I have not thought he's going to do it but um I I feel less secure about that assessment if if Putin is feeling desperate 
and and you know we're not there yet but i think that yeah a cornered Putin is not something we really want to see. And General Shirov has also said that this this war in Ukraine is also a war against NATO. He's called for a ramping up of Ukraine's capabilities and the removal of the restriction uh, limiting Ukraine from targeting military facilities inside Russia. Will NATO harden its resolve, do you think? Mm. I mean... <laughs> Sheriff is a hawk. I will say that um, he's he's pretty extreme. He did write a novel some years ago about the prospect of World War Three with uh, <laughs> with Russia. Um, will I don't think that NATO will give a public uh, OK to Ukraine using NATO supplied weapons on Russian soil. I don't think that will happen. It may happen on a sort of more informal basis or, or a less public uh, basis. I mean, in, in a sense, it is absurd to limit Ukraine in what, in what it can use. I mean, this is a, it is an absurdity in a sense that you can fight a war on your own territory, but you can't hit the, 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 you know, the back room, mm. because that's where it all comes from. That's where the war is being fought from. And there is a, you know, there's a problem for Ukraine. And, and we've seen that already, because Ukraine is already hitting Russia on its own soil, whether or not it's using um, NATO armaments, whether it's doing it with NATO's permission, it's happening. And I think we'll see more of that. And I mean, you have to, there's no way that Ukraine can win this war if it doesn't do that. Um, and and it's it's also unclear, you know, how far that permission from NATO goes. Does it include Crimea, for example, which is part of Ukraine, which was annexed illegally by Russia? Whatever you think about the validity of Russia's claim over uh, Crimea, it is annexed Ukrainian territory and it's recognized internationally as still being part of Ukraine. So that's a, a critical place that Ukraine has been hitting and and needs to continue to hit to win this war. And Catherine, what are you most keenly watching at the moment? In terms of, of I, what happens in Ukraine? Or in Russia? Uh, I <laughs> Right, exactly. So, um, I mean, I think that... What's happened with Prigozhin has brought the domestic uh, stability of Russia into focus as never before. And it's fascinating, but it's also deeply impenetrable impen for us. I mean, no one really has that um, insight into, you know, we only see what happens above this. It's like an iceberg. We only see the top of the iceberg, not the 90% that's below the surface. So when we see something happen in Russia that's public, we're just seeing that tip of the iceberg. So I'm watching that. I'm also watching to see um, what happens when the Ukrainian counteroffensive gets uh, started in earnest. So uh, they ha there are 12, uh, sorry, 12 brigades that have been trained for this offensive. Nine of them have been equipped and trained by NATO. We've only seen a small a proportion of that used so far. I I'm interested to see what happens when there is a full-blown combined arms offensive and we re really see that get going. And Catherine, when can we read your next article? Uh, well, it won't be on Ukraine because I'm not going back there for a while over the summer. I'll go there <laughs> in the autumn. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So if you read me, it's going to be more about things like I'm actually uh, this is this is actually um, closely associated with Russia's power play. But I'm, I'm my next trip that I have planned is to the Arctic to look at the geopolitics of the Arctic and um what Russia and China are doing there to try and uh, win strategic advantage out of what the rest of us see as a disaster, <laughs> climate change, um, in terms of uh, the Arctic is melting and there are more strategic uh, opportunities there.
You've been watching Frontline for Times Radio with me, Kate Chabot. My thanks to today's producer, Morgan Burdick, and to you for watching. If you'd like to support Frontline, you can subscribe now, or you can listen to Times Radio for regular updates and in-depth analysis, or go online to thetimes.co.uk. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye. 